Guys, it's finally time. Intel has actually provided direct, mostly upfront information about their new Comet Lake S series of desktop CPUs that are launching next month in May. And this is a little weird because when I've covered these in the past, they've been pretty straightforward, like year over year. They're mostly the same with a few little updates here and there. But Intel has been, I will say, a little bit cagey with some of the information this time around. That might have a little bit to do with the fact that uh, AMD is currently going strong with their current gen Ryzen 3000 series of processors, which are based on the seven nanometer manufacturing process. These new Comet Lake S CPUs are still based on 14 nanometer, but they do have a few upgrades, including going from eight cores max up to 10. But also, of course, in true Intel fashion, there's a new socket, a new chipset, and you will need to buy a new motherboard in order to use one of these processors. I joined a conference call where they shared all this information, so I'm gonna go over the high-level details first, then I'll go over the slides in the deck and talk about the stuff that I think is important or relevant. And finally, I have some direct questions that I asked Intel that they were kind enough to respond to, so I'll share that info with you too. Excellent! The Dark Core RGB Pro is a premium wireless gaming mouse from Corsair with a long list of features like an 18,000 DPI low power PixArt optical sensor for maximum precision with minimal power usage, attractive 9 zone dynamic RGB backlighting, and a comfortable contoured shape with two interchangeable side grips included. Connect wirelessly via Corsair's sub 1 millisecond slipstream technology, via Bluetooth for convenience on the go, or wired via USB C. Durable arm round switches, up to 50 hours of battery life, 8 fully programmable buttons, and more, so click the sponsor link in the description for details. So let's start from the top. What is it? When is it launching? How much does it cost? Uh, the answer to what it is, is a whole new lineup of 10th gen Intel Core desktop processors. These are still 14 nanometer processors. They are gonna require a new motherboard, an LGA 1200 Z490 motherboard, but the core count goes up to 10 cores and 20 threads now with the 10900K and derivatives thereof. And you can see the prices here on the right. Bear in mind, these are the prices if you buy them in lots of 1000. So the retail price is probably gonna be a little bit more than that. Probably 500 bucks for the 10900K is what I'm guessing. But there's your i9s and your i7s, 10 cores and eight cores. Your i5s will be six cores and 12 threads. Your i threes will be four cores and eight threads and note down here at the bottom the 10 100 10 300 10 320 are your four core eight thread cpus in the 125 to 155 dollar range possibly some nice deals on some entry level processors there but one thing that's bounced around a little bit is that second question which is when when are these available the first wave of reviews should be out on may 20th which is a wednesday at 6 a.m pacific time but may 20th is one day before May 21st, which is the date that AMD is launching their 3100 and 3300X. So we'll have to wait and see if reviews go out that just have these chips in them, and then the next day reviews go out that have these chips in them too. To be fair, a lot of people are probably gonna be more interested in the 10900K's performance, but just throwing that out there. The other thing to point out here is that we have hyper-threading all the way down the product stack. So there's no more six core, six thread processors hanging out in the i5 range, which I like and appreciate. I think that simplifies things and also gives people more threads to work with. You do still have some non-hyper-threaded stuff down here in the Pentium G range, the G5900 through G6600. Those are gonna be entry-level chips. And then here's the T-Series, uh, which are your low TDP, 35 watt TDP designed chips, which are also gonna be available pretty much from 10 cores all the way down to two. And I guess I could just wrap up the video there and be like, hey guys, new processors, May 20th, uh, there they are, there's the prices, that's the data. But Intel did do a teleconference that a bunch of tech press joined in on. So I wanted to go over their deck because there were some things that were missing from it. I was talking a little bit with Harbor Connects and they were saying the same thing, like, don't they usually give a little bit more details about the chipsets and the socket for the motherboard? It didn't seem to be anywhere to be found. So uh, like I said, I hit up Intel. I have a little bit more information that was in than what was in this deck. But let's run through this really quick because I think it shows sort of the angle that Intel is trying to take as they try to sell these processors and as they go up against the pretty stiff competition that AMD currently has going with their 3000 series. And the question I think we need to answer here is what is going to compel you guys, the users at home who might be interested in buy, building a new gaming PC or general purpose PC, what would it take to convince you to buy into this platform given that you're gonna need to buy a new motherboard and a new processor, even without considering the direct head-to-head uh, -head performance numbers that we're not gonna be able to share until 
May 20th. And I think there's some interesting things to point out. So first off, they're pitching this as the world's fastest gaming processor. And that certainly has been the thing that Intel has still been clinging to because they do have slightly better IPC performance, uh, even in their nine series, depending on what you're doing than what AMD currently has with their 3000 series Ryzen CPUs. That said, in order to show the difference in gaming performance, you typically have to run at lower resolutions like 1080 or below, because that puts more of a load on the CPU than the GPU. Whereas practically speaking, Speaking, a lot of people are going to be playing at higher resolutions with higher settings. They're going to be more GPU bound, so they're not going to necessarily see as much difference from chip to chip. On the CPU compute side of things, strictly speaking, AMD has been in the lead for some time because they have been putting out processors that have higher core counts and higher thread counts. But Intel, again, by adding hyper threading down the stack, might be a little bit more competitive in that regard with this generation. Now, what Intel is doing in order to make this, theoretically, the world's fastest gaming processor is juicing the frequency. We're looking at 5.3 gigahertz single core boost uh, on the highest end 10900K. 5.3 gigahertz out of the box is pretty decent. And I'm hoping that we'll see overclocking go even beyond that. As for the rest of the information I'm showing you guys here, please, please bear in mind, this is all direct from Intel. They're going to pitch their products in the best light that they possibly can. So there were some questions about some of these statements like around 60% of games are optimized for a single core. Which games are they including in that? How far back in time are they going? I can't answer that right now, but I will say just, just focus on the stuff that is like spec based, like 5.3 gigahertz. They can't say that and then not have the CPU run at 5.3 gigahertz. But let's move on to overclocking. They say that they've improved that too. New overclocking features include the ability to turn on or off hyperthreading on a per core level. An interesting feature that might uh, be helpful in niche circumstances with overclocking. I'm not sure how practical that will be for people who are just using the computer like a normal desktop, but there it is. Uh, PCI Express graphics and the DMI interface for the chipset can be overclocked. And again, we'll have to wait for testing to see if that provides any meaningful performance improvements. They have enhanced voltage frequency curve controls uh, as kind of demoed in the screenshot, so that's cool too. And they're refreshing the Intel Extreme tuning utility with some graphical enhancements and new features. I thought this was kind of interesting. They are manufacturing these CPUs with a thinner die than previous generations. So by going with a thicker uh, heat spreader, they're still maintaining the same Z height. So they're still maintaining compatibility uh, with existing coolers that are on the market, but a thinner die with the soldered thermal interface material that they're continuing to do as well, which I also appreciate. That's better for overclocking and thermal transfer. But other than the fact that they're going with a thin die this time around, I feel like this is pretty much the same as last generation. Intel Turbo Boost Max 3.0 is something that's been available on the uh, high-end desktop for quite some time. In fact, as you can see, I am running it right now because I have a 6950X in the system that I am currently recording this stream with. It's a good feature because the best cores are going to vary from CPU to CPU and this picks them and it assigns them to higher frequencies and it basically gives you more performance without increasing voltage. It's a good feature. I'm glad they're adding this to the mainstream. Here is your hero shot for the 10900K, 5.3 gigahertz, asterisk, 10 cores, 20 threads. Here's a slide that I wasn't going to show you because honestly, it's really misleading. D ignore like all these numbers. Note all the superscripts here. These are all uh, referenced down further down in the, do in the document, but they're different for each one. So it's really hard to look at this chart and actually derive anything from it. Also, they're not comparing anything to AMD. They're comparing it to older generation Intel processors, but they're even switching it between them, making some comparisons versus the 9900K, some comparisons versus 7700K. So it's just difficult. You really have to go down and reference this page against that one to actually try to see what they're saying with some of that stuff. It's, it's going to be better because it's a higher frequency, but ignore all of these numbers until independent reviews come out. Here's a slide I found to be uh, more interesting because it's just a list of all the new features with uh, this new generation, the 10th generation processors. 5.3 gigahertz, yeah, Turbo Boost Max 3.0, I already said that. Hyper threading all the way down to the i3s, cool, uh, hey, I said that too. Up to 10 cores with 20 megs Intel Smart Cache. Uh, when it comes to the cache, this is the only part in the entire document where it's mentioned, but you do get a larger cache with the 10900K at 20 megs. You still get a 16 meg cache with the 10700K, which is now the eight core. 10900K is the 10 core, 10600K, uh, is the six core and you get a 12 meg cache with that. So for the, the six core and the eight core, cache size is the same as last gen. Also, in case you're wondering, and this was uh, some extra information that was sent over by Intel, this has the UHD graphics and the base frequency and max frequency for the iGPU in these CPUs. They bumped up the DDR4 base support. So base support is 2933 now, although of course you're probably going to be able to run uh, higher clocked memory than that. Enhanced core memory overclocking, the 400 series chipset. I don't know if that's like new, hey, cool, 
cool feature. Uh, I mean, there are some improvements to it, but it does, again, mean that you need a new motherboard. Uh, I thought this was kind of nice. There's a 2.5 gigabit uh, ethernet connection available. It's gonna be up to the motherboard manufacturer whether or not they add it to individual motherboards, but uh, that's a nice little upgrade from the gigabit LAN that's been sort of ubiquitous for quite a few years. Also, you got Wi-Fi 6 support, AX201 gig plus. So that's a nice uh, feature to have. Native networking solutions from Intel are often very nice. I find these to be less compelling as a reason to buy the entire platform though, because you can always add this type of thing if you have expansion slots available for it. Also, XTU support 40 platform and PCIe lanes means it's basically, again, still the same configuration. PCI Express 3.0, 16 lanes dedicated for the GPU or your PCIe expansion slots, and then four lanes available for the DMI interface, and then those are uh, muxed out to give you 24 lanes available, but those are all going through the DMI interface, so effectively you still have four lanes there. Thunderbolt 3 support is also a nice feature, and Optane technology support uh, is cool, but I rarely see people actually use that in my line of work. All right, I've caught back up to the actual processor list and a couple more things to point out here is that yes, they are still doing a K SKU and a KF SKU. The KF SKU does not have graphics integrated, but it is unlocked. So that means there are four variants of the 10900. The K, which is the fully unlocked one with integrated graphics. The KF, unlocked, no integrated graphics. Then just the 10900, integrated graphics, but not unlocked. And then the 10900F, no integrated graphics, not unlocked. And of course those get cheaper as you move your way down. Same goes for the 10700 and so on. So I find that to be somewhat confusing, but hopefully this chart helps you sort it out. And again, don't be fooled by this platform PCIe 3.0 lanes because you effectively have 16 for your GPU and then you've got four more for the DMI. That's one thing I was hoping they would add this time around to again, be more equivalent with what AMD is currently offering on uh, AM4, which is an additional four PCIe lanes dedicated for an NVMe SSD, a nice feature that is currently lacking here. That said, with 16 lanes for the GPU, you can easily do like a by eight for your GPU and still add NVMe SSDs. It's just still fewer than what AMD currently has. I guess it's also worth noting that that DDR4 2933 support goes down to the 10700 eight core uh, when you get below that, it's still DDR4 2666. Again, this is baseline memory frequency, so you can always put in a better rated kit and chances are you will be able to get it to work. Intel is pretty flexible with higher speed memory. Other interesting things. Here are all the testing configurations they used for all those uh, benchmark performance numbers that they compared to each other. They do have a 3950X system listed out here with all of the details for it but they are not showing any 3950X comparisons in the benchmarks that they have published in this document. So I wonder what that means when it comes to the results they got with that processor. Here's a quick look at all the game titles and settings they were using in case you're interested. And then a few notes on how they used Premiere Pro as well as PUBG. I'm sorry if this text is small, but here's a list of all the system configurations that they were using here because they've got a 7700K, a 9900K, 10900K, 3950X, 9900KS. A couple things to point out. All of the CPUs, and that includes the AMD one, we're using water cooling. So uh, that might indicate that yes, you are probably gonna need a beefy cooler, especially if you're running the higher end CPUs like the 10900K, even more, especially if you're playing to overclock. And then we have some power limit information over here because if you follow Intel and how they've been doing like TDP and power limits for a while, it's not quite as straightforward as it used to be. And I think that actually is hopefully a good point to segue over to some of the answers I got from Intel when I asked them about some of these things. So first off, for power limit one, power limit two, as well as the TAU value for how long those processors can boost to the higher speeds before they have to dial back. 10900K, power limit one is 125, power limit two is 250, and the TAU is 56 seconds. 56 seconds across the board, uh, power limit one is 125 for the 10700K and 10600K as well, and the power limit two is 229 and 182 for the uh, eight core and the six core respectively. Effectively, what this means is for a processor like the 10900K that has that single core boost of up to 5.3 gigahertz, as well as an all core boost of 4.8 gigahertz, these values can typically be adjusted in the motherboard BIOS, but uh, out of the box, this is gonna determine how long your processor can boost to that all core frequency, which for the 10900K, for example, is 4.8 gigahertz across all cores. Here's a couple other questions. I apologize if this text is small, but I was asking about the platform because in that entire deck, it didn't say, LGA 1200 anywhere and it barely, I don't think it said uh, Z490 either. So I just wanted to confirm that yes, there is a new socket and new motherboards. 10th gen processors use LGA 1200 motherboards. The socket includes improved power delivery and support for future incremental IO features. I was asking about like PCIe 4.0 support as well as maybe support for next gen CPUs that might be launching later this year. They're not commenting on that 
but the socket does include improved power delivery and support for future incremental I.O. features. So I will leave that to your interpretation as to whether or not something is being indicated there. Probably not. Uh, finally though, Z490, will it be the high-end chipset that will pair with the CPUs? Will it be required for unlocked OC support? Uh, he confirmed that Z490 supports overclocking. He did not say it would be the only chipset that supports overclocking. And this is rumor and speculation, but there's been some rumor and speculation that since AMD currently allows overclocking on their B series boards like B450 and the upcoming B550, which will support PCI Express 4.0, that Intel might compete with that a little bit better if they also launched a more entry level, less expensive chipset that you could also overclock on. We still don't know the answer to that, but the answer to this question at least doesn't rule that out. Lastly, I was sent over the Z490 or Z490 if you're a Pulp Fiction fan chipset block diagram here. I always like taking a look at these just because it shows you what's available when it comes to connectivity. Uh, it's pretty similar to the 300 series chipset block diagram as far as the breakout for PCI Express lanes. You just got a little bit faster speed memory. There's your DMI interface between the CPU and the chipset and all the features of the chipset as well. You are getting native USB 3.2 Gen 2 by one ports, which is nice. Not not native Gen 2 by 2 though, but motherboard manufacturers will have the option to add that in. And then these lighter blue features are optional, but there also you can see that 2.5 gigabits uh, ethernet jack that is an option for motherboard manufacturers to integrate into motherboards. Unfortunately, I can't show you any uh, details about the motherboards, at least as far as I know right now. So that is gonna have to wrap up this video, guys. I hope you have learned a little bit more about what Intel is planning to launch uh, very soon, coming in May. Again, May 20th is when you should keep your eye out for the independent reviews testing the performance of these chips. I don't know which chips are gonna be sent to reviewers. That was one of my other questions that we don't really know for sure right now, if everyone's gonna be covering the 10900K or if we're gonna see some more comparisons for other products down the stack. I'm again, pretty interested to see how those uh, more entry level quad cores with hyper threading that they have now are gonna stack up against what AMD has coming out. Because again, AMD already said that these two chips are launching on May 21st. And then Intel came in and was like, hey, our review embargo is gonna be one day before that. We will have to wait and see what that actually means. But uh, for now, thank you for watching this video. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it and uh, check the video's description down there because I'll probably put links to things like my store, my store where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, really cool merch, help support me, get yourself some awesome stuff, nice soft t-shirts and the ability to open beers with the greatest of ease among other things. Thanks again for watching guys. We'll see you next time.